Welcome again to the service. We are excited that you are here for our sir. Yeah. Our first round of, uh, or excuse me, our second round, I'm struggling here. Our second round of sermons on uh, kind of myth busters and relationships. And uh, we got all kinds of comments and feedback last week. Uh, and we're excited about where we're going with this because uh, we believe one of the reasons that relationships fall apart is because we enter them with all kinds of myths and false expectations of how they're going to work and how they'll survive. And so we think that we're kind of doing some serious battle against some uh, some, some enemies of great relationships. And one of our goals is to talk not just about uh, marriage, but about friendships, about uh, job relationships. And so we're going to have these conversations about any work relationship. But then we want to kind of fall and rest on the idea of marriage. And so if you're dating, the good news is, is that this is like a preview of how to have a healthy marriage. And so if you're a teenager right now, and you may be sitting there going, you know, I'm a young teenager like, look, marriage is not, not anywhere on my radar. Here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you're soaking some of what we say in so that as you start dating, you date in a more healthy way, that you have healthy expectations. If you are married, I'm hoping that when you leave today, you go, we got some homework to do. Like, we can make our marriage better based off of what was said here, and, and we, can, we, we can just care for each other better. And wouldn't that be a good thing? If you are divorced, if you, you're coming out of a broken relationship, hopefully you go, hey, there are some ways that, that I might have been able to save that marriage, but I'm going to do it better next time. And when I start dating again, if I start dating again, this is the ways that I'm just going to think about it different. If you have a close friend and you go, we, you know, we used to be really close, but I, we're not so close anymore. I wonder why. These may be the secrets and clues to what happened. And so today we're going to talk about the word expectations. And we don't use that word very often, but we're going to talk about expectations and show you how you actually think about them every day and every situation all the time. You just don't say, this was my expectation and this is why it's wrong. And so here's what we know. We're going to teach you a formula then today that, that literally can save your marriage. It can make or break any relationship. Not just a marriage, but your best friend, your, your job relationship with your boss, any relationship. We're going to teach you something that can save, can, can make or break your relationship. So an expectation is a strong belief that something will or should or could happen in the future. A strong belief about what should, could, will happen in the future. It's what you think should happen next. It's the picture you have of the event or the way it's going to look in just a moment. All right? And when you have an expectation, you're kind of picturing like what's going to be next. This is what's going to be next. And again, we don't use the word very often, expectation. We say things like this. I thought you were going to, and what we're really saying is, is I had an expectation. This is what I thought would happen, but instead this happened. We also say stuff like this, but you should have. Right? And that's saying, hey, I had an expectation. We say things like this. If it were me, I would have. Again, we're just communicating like, this is kind of how I thought it would be done. If it were me, this is how it would be done. You're an idiot for not doing it the way I thought it should be done. All right? Or the other one that I really like, why in the world would you do that? Right? And that's just saying like, hey, I had a pretty clear explanation. I thought it was pretty clear, and, and you're clueless right now. All right? And so when we use those phrases, we're talking about not just expectations, but the key here is unmet expectations. Let me say that again. We're talking about unmet met expectations. Expectations, expectations are, are everywhere, all right? Expectations are everywhere. <clears throat> so you, you go to McDonald's, and you have an idea you're going to order, all right? You're going to order a, 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 a Big Mac or a cheeseburger, all right? And so this is kind of where you're at. Uh, this is what you're thinking. Your expectation was this. This is what you got. Are you excited? I mean, you unwrap that dude, and you're like, what the? All right? Now, again, just expectations are everywhere. In every relationship and everything we do, they're everywhere. All right? They're everywhere. All right? You came home expecting every day. My, my, you know, when you got married, you were like, my spouse is going to kiss me every day. Because that's what they do in the movies. And you come home, and there are days when your spouse doesn't even want to see you. You don't kiss you. And you're like, what happened? I say to my wife on a, on a regular basis, I go, <clears throat> we wake up and I go, how, how come we never greet each other in the morning with a kiss? And she goes, because we're not in the movies. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, nobody in the movies has bad breath or bad hair. She goes, and you got both. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, expectations, this is one of my favorites. By the way, I think I'm going to hell for this one, okay, just to be clear. But uh, you, you had an expectation? I, I'm sorry, I laughed at that so long. <laughs> and I know I'm going to hell for this one. Right? But I just thought it was hilarious. Right? Hey, again, we expected to go see this, and this is what happened. All right, well, my wife and I have regular conversations about what we do and do not expect this when we go see a movie. I, I go see movies or shows to escape reality. My wife goes to them to enter more drama. And I'm like, I have enough drama in my life. I want shows where the good guys win, the guy and girl get together, they live happily ever after, the bad guys all lose, and everybody goes home, and it's just, you know, we all go, ooh, I feel better about that. She wants a movie where, like, life is destroyed. People cry the entire way through the movie, and there's no resolution at the end. We just leave with like this unattended drama going, I'm sick to my stomach. Why are people so evil? I, go, I don't want to want that. When I go see a movie, I expect it to look this way. When it turns out this way, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel like I, I enjoyed myself. Why? Because we have expectations that are either met or expectations that are unmet. Expectations that are either met or expectations that are unmet. And so the formula... All right, the formula that, that we're talking about uh, looks like this. It's E minus R <laughs> equals D. Let me give that to you again. E minus R equals D. Expectation minus reality equals disappointment. Expectation minus reality equals disappointment. Again, expectation minus reality equals disappointment. Let me show you how that works. Expectation, when I came home, I expected dinner to be on the table. The reality of it was there was no dinner. <coughs> My disappointment is I'm not only going to bed disappointed, but I'm also going to bed hungry, which is really bad, right? Because I can handle the disappointment. I can't hunger. All right. Expectation. You're, you're my best friend. I, you knew I had a bad day. I expected you to call. Reality, you forgot about me. Disappointment. I now wonder as I'm sitting alone at my house, are we still friends? Right, right. All right, expected. When you said you were going to take me out for a nice evening, I kind of had in mind maybe like Logan's Steakhouse. Why do I have a Happy Meal? All right, now, if you're dating, that's expectation, reality, and now you're not dating. Okay? <coughs> I expected you to care for me. And you lied to me. You broke my heart. You were dishonest. You cheated on me. And now we're not together. And just like this slide right here, we have our expectation, and it was all the way out here. But with you, our expectations never seem to be met. They always seem to fall just short. The outcome, the reality, never quite gets to where it needs to be. So I always live with a certain amount of disappointment. Disappointment. Now, <clears throat> to be fair, to be fair, this is the way most of us live. I just assumed you knew what I wanted to have happen. Because we assume that everybody else around us has the same personality, has the same mindset that we do, and therefore we assume they can read our mind and know what should happen next. But most of us do not clearly communicate our expectations. Therefore, in a sick way, we choose to live with disappointment on a regular basis because I haven't told you what I want. Ladies, let me just be fair. All right? I don't know why you expect us guys to be mind readers. Okay? Let's face it, the facts. We're dumb. Okay? I've yet, I've yet to be able to look at some lady and she go, tell me what I'm thinking right now. And get it right. All right? Because I'm always thinking, is it a coney dog right now? Are you thinking about a coney dog? No, I'm not thinking about a coney dog. What's wrong with you? I'm not thinking about, is, do you want to make out with me, dear? Is that what, because that's what I'm thinking right now. You want to make it? No, that's not what I'm thinking. All right, look, ladies, we, we're no good at this, okay? We're just not very smart. Well, guys are very simple, and we expect, our expectation is that when you expect something from us, that you will say to me, husband, I would like this. Most of us are very trainable. We will go, I will do my best to make that happen. Or we might even respond in a healthy way saying, I don't think that can happen. And here's why. 
And then we can compromise and adjust the expectations. Therefore, none of us lives with disappointment. But on a regular basis, we don't talk about our expectations. And therefore, we continually live in what? Disappointment. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first two don't have anything to do with marriage at all. Dad walks into his daughter's room. Dad says, oh my goodness, did a war happen in here? Was there a, a clothing fight? The little gremlins come in and scatter everything in your room? The daughter says, Dad, do you want me to clean my room? Yes, clean your room. Dad leaves, comes back. The floor has now been empty. It is safe to walk across the room without worrying about a landmine until Dad looks under the bed. And then he glances in the closet. How many of you know where all the stuff on the floor went? Yeah, all right. Good, good. So the expectation from dad was, you're going to clean this room. You're going to put stuff away where it should be. What the daughter heard was, hey, how fast can I shove everything in the closet and under the bed? Now, to be fair, to be fair, I'm willing to bet in most relationships that the expectations the father had were probably already understood. And were probably very clear. But may not have been. Okay? May not have been. And then there are consequences for not living into expectations. And by the way, teenagers and young kids, if a parent comes in and say, tells you to clean the room, there's no longer a compromise system that goes on. The room just gets cleaned. Right, parents? Amen? Uh, I, yeah. we, don't, we don't go, well, you cleaned up three-fourths of it. We're going to give you three-fourths credit. We'll give you a B. Move on and have fun. All right? All right, expectation case number two. You have a new boss coming in the work tomorrow. Okay? You have a new boss coming in the work tomorrow. How many of you have ever had a, a new boss come in and you, you were underneath him? Yeah, all right, three of you. The rest of you have been unemployed. That's okay. Your new boss is coming in the work. Your previous boss was kind of a jerk, was manipulative, was a bully, all right? It was someone that, that, that would use and take what you said and twist it and use it against you. Sometimes would even take reports that you gave and rework them to make themselves look better. And, and so you got a new boss coming in, all right? Your new boss sets everybody down at a table, all right, and says, I'm new here. Uh, I, I want to build a an organizational atmosphere of trust and, and openness, all right? And I just, let's talk about some of the historic problems and how we can move on. Are, are, are we going to share with that new boss some of the challenges that we've had in the past? No. Why? Because we learned not to trust the boss, right? Our expectation of this person, whether right or wrong, they haven't done anything to deserve this to our knowledge yet, but we just expect that a boss behaves in a way that is manipulative, hurtful, harming, bullying, all right? We just, we just have that expectation. Why? Because of the previous situation. Now, here's what's important. Every relationship you have, every relationship you have, most of us assume it starts at ground zero. No relationship you have starts at ground zero. Every relationship you have starts with the baggage of the previous relationships associated with the type of relationship you have. And so if it's a boss, your relationship with your boss doesn't start on ground zero. It starts with the type of relationship you had with the previous boss or bosses. If it's a friend, that relationship doesn't start with, hey, this is who my friend is. We're at ground zero. It starts with his or her previous relationships with friends and your previous relationship with friends. I learned that I can't trust people. I learned that I can trust you implicitly. I learned that I can trust you up to this point. I learned that I can share this much, but not this much. Again, why? You learn that from previous. So your expectation of this relationship is now grounded on a previous relationship. This is huge in our marriage because each and every one of us walks into a marriage then and what we bring in with us is, hi, you're going to marry me and these three trailer loads of junk that I can't figure out how to forgive myself or get over. Would you, would, would you please say I do to me and these three trailer loads? You can't really see, but trust me, they're here. All this baggage you're getting. The expectation is, is that you're going to help me work through that or we're going to live in these trailers forever. All right. Hey, let me give you one more. One more. All right. Uh, case number three. Uh, those of you that are dating, teenagers, heads up. You ready? New boyfriend is exactly what she's been looking for. He's the man of her dreams. She's, he's got like a 17 pack. I mean, this guy stands up and muscles ripple on his toes. And he is so sweet. He opens the door not just for her, but for every girl in the school. And when he asked her out, he came up with a single rose petal. And he said to her, 
Guys, you can steal this, by the way. But he said to her, dear, I was going to get you a rose to ask you out. But since it's the start of our relationship, I wanted to begin it very slowly and honor you with just a single rose petal as a symbol of my love beginning for you in a very small way. Don't lie. You know how she responded. She's like, turn the oil right there, right? She's like, Let, please scoop me off the ground so I can say yes, right? And, 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 and she says yes. And they've been dating for a couple weeks. But her previous relationship wasn't quite the same. Her previous relationship, the guy looked like Mr. Right, but he had a, an anger issue. And he would get angry, and, and, and he, would, he would have violent outbursts. On occasion, he even hurt her. And she tried to hide it and lie to her parents and everybody, but eventually she got wise enough to move on past this guy. Amen. And, 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 and she lives now with a certain amount of fear that is this guy going to be like, because, I mean, this guy looked good. And, I mean, just, is he going to turn out the same? And so, so they're sitting in the parking lot of the school one day, and he's getting ready to take her out, and he's got all these plans that he's made up of how to care for her and cherish her and honor her. And his mom calls and said that she's, she's not feeling well, but she's got to work late, and he, he can't go out on a date. He's got to go home and watch his younger siblings. He hangs up the phone and goes, dang it! She screams, jumps out of the car, and runs back into the school. He's sitting there in the passenger seat. I don't know, maybe she forgot something in the classroom. Maybe she's running back to get something, right? Why did she leave? What, she, what is she expecting to happen next? Yeah. Yeah, she, she lives with all those previous moments and drags all those into the next relationship. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. Now, now just in case you start to think that all expectations are evil, all expectations are bad, I, I, that's not what we should say, all right? There are expectations that are actually good for us, okay? They become healthy, all right? Because not all expectations are wrong, are, are bad. I expect that when I come home, no matter how dumb I behave, no matter what mistakes I made, that when I come home, my wife is going to go, I still love you. Amen? I mean, I just, I expect that when I come home, I'm going to be greeted by someone who's going to go, I knew you weren't perfect, and I love you anyways. Right? All right? I expect that when I turn on my computer, it'll work. Because not all expectations are bad. Some of them are good, right? I expect that when I go to Wendy's and I order French fries, there's going to be way too much salt on them. And I'm going to like them that way. Right? Why? Because I don't care about my cholesterol. We're going to die. Right? All right? I expect. I expect certain things that are good. And expectations aren't always bad. Some of them they are good. And then sometimes we have really low expectations. William Shakespeare said that, that expectations are the root of all heartbreak, but they can also be the root of all joy. Because sometimes we go into something with low expectations and it actually turns out really good. You ever done that? Like, oh, we'll go see that band. I really don't like that kind of music. I don't really like that band. And you leave going, hey, that was pretty good. I like that. All right. Some of you have had teachers or bosses and you were like, Oh my gosh, this is going to be horrible. This class is going to be terrible. And, and if you enter in with those low expectations, often they meet your expectation, but every once in a while they exceed them. And like, you're like, and I was the greatest professor everywhere. I don't know what all those people said. They were crazy. Some of us came to church like that. We came to church with previous situations, and we come to church, and in fact, someone's had to bribe us into coming to church, or they've had to say, look, we're not like that, we're not like, and we have all these previous experiences with churches and pastors, and we, we walked into the building today, and we went, hey, there's people in normal clothes. And then and you saw someone walk into the gym with coffee, and you went, you, we, we can take that in there? I mean, my church, where I grew up, wouldn't even let coffee be in the building. And, 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 then, and, then, and then you heard someone say something that was funny, and you heard people laugh, and you went, wait, there's no laughing at church, because I know all Christians, they, they, know, they don't laugh. God doesn't like laughing, right? And again, whatever, whatever situation you came from, you, you have these expectations. And one of the joys that we have as a church is to say, you know what? We 
live differently, we, we kind of go, here's what we expect the church to look like. We expect the church to have fun. We expect the church to be interactive. We expect the church to, to say, Jesus, what are you most excited about? And then we chase after that. And for, for many of us, and we jokingly call this service like the service for people recovering from church, because we had expectations where we got hurt, and yet we gather here and go, we just, there's something different. There's something different. In fact, we had one lady who left our service one time, and she said, you know what? It's great. I come to church. I usually feel good about myself. I've learned something. I learned something about Jesus. And she goes, I got to go to a different church. And I said, why? She goes, because I think church is only when you go and you feel terrible about yourself and you leave feeling so guilty. I went, oh, okay, then we're not it for you, right? We, we don't see that's the way Jesus did now. Okay, all I'm saying is that your expectations have a huge impact on what's going to happen. And here's where we get in trouble. Where we get in trouble, again, is when I don't communicate it. When I don't communicate my expectations, it is unfair to expect a person to behave in a certain way that they can or cannot meet my expectation. And we do this all the time. All the time we do this, okay? We go, I'm upset with you because you didn't. What are we saying, really? I expected you to behave this way. I expected you to carry out these instructions. I expected you to do this. All right, almost every time we get upset with someone that we love and care about, it's because they did not meet our expectations. And it is unfair to place that burden on another person if we haven't said to them, this is the expected behavior. Now, how does that look? In a practical way, this is how you do that. You ready? My wife and I do this on a regular basis, and we don't sit down and go, let's have the expectation conversation. We sit down, and I go something like this. I say, so what's on the schedule for tomorrow? I see, what I'm really asking is, is what should we expect to happen tomorrow? And what she's hearing is, what's on the agenda tomorrow? What we're really communicating is, what should we expect to have happen tomorrow? Okay? And she begins to tell me the calendar. And, and then I ask questions just to clarify the expectations. I'll say things like, so what are you, what, what, what are you wanting to do for dinner? And if she says, hey, we're going out to eat, okay, that's what we should expect. And now I just got to figure out that. If she says, hey, is there anything here for us? Then I know code, please cook something so that we don't have to go out, so that we don't have to do frozen pizza anymore. All right? Again, all we're doing is clarifying expectations. When you sit down with your children and you say to them, hey, tomorrow this is going to happen. We have this event going on. All right? Your sister's got a ball game. What your child hears is that your sister has a ball game. What your child should hear is, and I expect you to be there, right? We just didn't say it like that, all right? And so that's how we begin to communicate expectations is we just tell people what's going on, and this is the behavior that we expect. Now, again, let me break this down in the marriage real quick. We decided to use one passage this entire series, okay? One passage this entire series is Ephesians 5. If you got a your device, you want to open it up and go there with us. All right, you can pull that up. Ready, Ephesians 5. And, and it's a really fascinating passage because if we, if we immediately start here, some of you have a history with this passage. And you have an expectation of how we're going to read this and what it's going to turn into. And this passage, in all fairness, has been used historically by many people to be abusive and dominating to their spouse, especially men to women. But that's not at all what this passage says. In fact, when it was used that way, it was used incorrectly and out of context of Scripture. So what I want to do is I want to read it to you, and then I want to give you kind of, hey, here's historically how we misuse this, but then talk about what God expects, because these are expectations of behavior of a church to each other. And then God says, and I want to give you an example of how you should behave with each other, I want to talk about how husbands and wives should behave. So this is what it says, Ephesians 5:21. It says, "Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another." So out of respect not to each other, whether you deserve it or not, here this way, out of respect for Christ, behave this way, this way. Wives understand and support your husbands. In this way, show your support to Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to the church, not by, well, not by, not by domineering, but by cherishing. Again, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives likewise submit to their husbands. All right, now pause. Okay, 
historically, the church has used this and taken this word submit. Wives, you have to submit to anything I say, anything I do, and we abuse our spouses by using this passage. But that's not at all what it's saying. In fact, when you read this passage, it's not a passage to the wives. It's a passage to the husband to do what? To behave like Christ. Well, hold on, Paul. Paul's the guy that wrote it, by the way. Hold on, Paul. what, What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, good news. Paul anticipated and expected your question. Isn't that amazing? He expected your question. All right? And so he goes on to answer it. He says, husbands. 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 Eyes. Ready? Ladies, that's how you do it, by the way. We're, again, we're like dogs. Just trying to... All right? All right? Here, boy. Here, boy. All right? You ready? All right? Go all out in love for your wife. Exactly as Christ did for the church. Oh, my goodness. You mean, Jesus, I got to... I got to love my wife like you love the church? Boy, that is tough. I mean, there are days in my marriage I feel like she put me on the cross, but I don't know. I mean, just, just, that was meant to be a joke. Come on, guys. A little grace there, right? All right. A love marked by, uh uh-oh, giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His love and his words evoke her beauty. Man, when was the last time you evoked her beauty with your words? Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best in her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that's how husbands ought to love their wives. Now, listen, listen, this is the real fun part. I just want to touch on this just briefly. When husbands do this, they're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. And again, this is where we've seen this passage abuse. You know, see, wives, they're underneath their husbands in authority, and they got to submit. And, and, and Paul says, yeah, you missed it. When you're married, you're already one. When my wife and I sit down, we don't have a discussion. I go, well, give me your opinion, and I'll tell you how it's going to be. Right? That wouldn't work in my marriage. All right? Why? Because we're already one. We keep working it out until we both go, that is the smartest idea. Why? Because it's not that she's under me, and I'm over her, or she's over me, and I'm under her. We're, we're one. And my goal in a marriage when I read this passage is to say, how do I outlove my wife so that she is never in want for anything or anyone else? But she goes, my husband has cared for me in such a way that he daily woos me back to him. Now, just in case you're, you're going, how, wait, how's this time? The expectation of how a husband behaves is given by Christ through this moment and passage of Scripture. So let's break it down. What are the expectations that God has for us husbands? And again, wives, you're not excluded. You can behave the exact same way, all right? Let's go to the next slide. It looks like this. You ready? Let's break it down. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wife. Go all out. Don't hold it back. Go all out. Go on. In fact, Andy Stanley wrote a book a couple years ago called Choosing to Cheat, and this was the idea, is that most of us exhaust all our energy at work And by the time we get home to our spouse, we're exhausted and we have nothing left to give. We're like a cup that's been poured out all day. And when we get home, we're begging our spouse to fill us up. And he says, but what is the most important relationship? The one at home. And so we ought to choose to cheat. If we're going to empty a cup, let's just pour a little bit out of work. Let's make sure that when we get home, our spouse is lavished with our love. As she goes, holy cow, you, you, you love me so much. I couldn't wait to see you when you got home. So go all out in love with your wife, all right, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. So what's that look like? It's very simple. Who should load the dishwasher? (laughs) Who should have to tell the kids to load the dishwasher? Who should get up and change the channel on TV when the remote gets broke? Who should take the dogs out? Who should be the one that leaves the house and goes and gets the milk at 4.30 in the morning because there's no more milk for the kids to eat? Who should be the one who is giving? Not always concerned about getting. And what does that look like? Now, pause pause because here's what you could be doing again if you're married what you should be doing right now is kind of in the back of your mind even taking notes on your twitter or something tweet it out and that way you got a note for yourself all right you should be going how do i do this better for my wife 
How do I say to my wife, I love you so much, I want our marriage to be marked with giving. That's what God expects of me. Now, how do I do that, dear? What would your expectation be if I outgave you in our marriage? If every day you woke up and go, gosh, if it were a competition, honey, you would be number one because you outgive me every day. Christ's love makes the church whole. This isn't the Jerry Maguire myth that you complete me and without you I'm only half a person. All right, That's just silly. All right? This isn't the, per, the, the myth that I, I live with all these insecurities, and when you're with me, suddenly my insecurities vanish. All right? This is the idea that, that when I am with you, you help me feel like I can take on the world. You remind me there's nothing I can't do. You remind me that if I just set my mind and heart to it, I can get there and I can do it. Why? Because I'm an amazing person with you standing behind me. Number two, or three, his words evoke her beauty. Not just in private, when you're wanting to get something, gentlemen. I'm talking about cake, Wesley. Cake, all right. But in public as well. This is my beautiful wife. Some of you are still working on that. Don't worry about it, okay? How do I speak in such ways that my wife goes, I love being in public with my husband because his words evoke my beauty. His words evoke my beauty. And I love this one. It brings out the best of her, dressing her, dressing her in dazzling white silk. Now, if you're like me, you're like, what does that even mean? All right, now, let me just, the, the best example that I have for this was my Grandpa Wayne. My Grandpa Wayne was the, the second. Uh, my, my, my grandfather passed away, and Grandma married Grandpa Wayne, who uh, we joke was crazy, and he was. Uh, and Grandpa Wayne uh, was blind because uh, Grandma would wake up in the morning, and she had like one of those fro hairdos things going on. And when she would wake up in the morning, this half would be flat. This half would be froed out. And it, it looked like, I don't know, she had her head smashed in the middle of the night, right? And she would come down and eat breakfast, and we'd all be like, whoa! Never mind. Right? And, and, and Wayne would come down. This is how I know he's blind. And he would come down, and he'd give her a kiss on the cheek, and he would say, oh, Marilyn, you look beautiful. There are angels in heaven that don't look as good as you right now. And I would be sitting there and go, man, you were blind! You not see her hair? What's wrong with you? Right? And then she would be in the car. And on a rare occasion, I would always drive because Wayne scared me to death because he's blind, right? And so I would be driving. And I would, I would reach up to the radio because Grandma would start singing along with the Gaithers. Now, at one time, my grandmother had a beautiful voice. But as with many of us, as we get old, we lose some of the, some of the pleasure in our voice. Let's say, is that fair to say? Medina, is that okay to say it that way, right? All right? And, and so as she got older, some of the, the pleasure in her voice kind of decreased and decreased. And so we'd be listening to the Gaithers as we drove along, and Grandma would start singing, and I would reach up to the radio and turn it up because I thought if I could just get Bill and Gloria high enough that I didn't have to hear Grandma on the back seat singing with them, right? And I would turn it up, and Wayne would turn to me and he'd go, now, Aaron, turn that down. I can't hear your grandmother sing. You know, Marilyn, your voice, it is so beautiful. It is like an orchestra pouring into my ears I'd be going what the hell are you listening to can you not hear her sing she's terrible and we would go out to eat at places and he would pull out a chair for her and he would say now Marilyn sit here it is the place for the queen and you my dear are the most important person in this entire restaurant and I am so thankful for the moments that I got to be with them and watch them interact because Wayne would teach us what it meant to dress her in dazzling white silk. And I am so thankful that my, my grandmother had years to be with a man who cared for her and spoke to her in such a way that she walked around going, you know what, I don't care what the rest of you think because this guy beside me thinks I'm the best thing ever. And I live going, how do I be a husband? That my wife walks around going, I don't care what the rest of you think. Because my husband over here, he knows I am the best thing ever. Dress her in dazzling white silk. Now, yeah, these are the expectations that Jesus has for you in your relationship. Time out. If you're dating 
and your guy or gal that you're dating can't begin to live into this, guess what? The expectation that when you get married, they'll change and suddenly treat you this way is a lie. Your person you're dating can be learning how to do this, but they ought to already be doing this. Your expectations of who you're dating, they need to be raised up. And you need to be okay being alone for a while until you find someone who's mature enough and loves Jesus enough that says, I'm going to date and treat you like this passage says to treat you. Amen? Well, that was really weak for my parents. All right? If you have a daughter in your house, dads, moms, how do we do these things for her so that when she starts dating, how do, we, how do we wrap our arms around her and evoke her beauty with these words, make her whole, love her by giving, not getting, so that when she starts dating, she goes, you know what, my mom and dad, they treat me better than you do. You're a bozo. Go away. Right? How do, we, how do we raise the expectations of who he or she will date so high that they don't want to date idiots? That should be our goal as parents when it comes to dating. Now, here's, here's where we want to go very practical, okay? We're going to kind of wrap it up and close it with this. Ready? Three, three practical ideas to move forward with this passage. Number one. Number one. Ready? We need to repent. Okay? And this is why I say this. This is where we start. We need to repent because, number one, I have failed expectations. Now, the good news is my wife reminded me today that her expectations are really low because when I went to kiss her and say goodbye, uh, I said, uh, dear, we're talking about expectations. And she says, oh, mine are really low. I just expect you to make coffee in the morning. I went, I'm good. Right? I've done it today, right? Uh, but I knew she was lying to me, and she expects a lot more than that. All right? I knew that, that she expects a lot more than that. And so, so I... Sometimes we just got to start by saying, I'm sorry. And I thank you for your grace. And I just want you to know I'm repenting of not meeting your expectations. And we can do that with a friendship. We can do that with a coworker. We can do that with a boyfriend, girlfriend. We can do that with our spouse. We can do that with our parents. We can do that with our children. I am sorry I have not met your expectations. Forgive me. Now, the key to repent is you're going to behave different because otherwise it's just you said you're sorry. But repent means you actually have a change of behavior. Number two, we need to clarify our expectations. If you're dating, what are the expectations you have for the guy or gal you're dating? If you're married, what are the expectations that you have for your spouse? We're not talking about your spouse's expectations for you. Because again, a lot of us haven't sat and figured out what are the expectations. When my mom and dad got married, my mom almost drove a car into the ground. Dad finally got in it one day and he went, holy cow, the oil change is like 9,000 miles past due. And she said to him, you're the man. I just, don't men change oil in cars? Now, her dad is a mechanic. My dad doesn't know anything about cars. But her expectation was, oil change, dad changes, dad, that's, what, that's what the men do, right? Yeah. What are the expectations that you have for your spouse? You may not even know these. You're just constantly upset with the person, and you don't even know why. Okay? And we can have all kinds of conversations about how did your parents behave because most of your expectations came from them, whether good or bad. All right? And then number three. All right? Husbands, wives, ask your spouse, what are three things that we could do? What are three things that we could do that could demonstrate the type of love in Ephesians 5 that would help me better meet your expectations of what the perfect husband would be? of what the perfect spouse would be. What are three things? Ladies, ladies, just three. I know you got a grocery list. All right? Just give us three, and we'll work on that. In, in six months, you can give us another three. All right? But what, just, just give me three things that I could do to be a better husband to you. Give me three things that I could do to be a better friend to you. Give me three things that I could do to be a better coworker. I could be a better employee. Just give me three things that I could do to better meet your expectations. And finally, this is really interesting. Sometimes we have unfair expectations of God. We expected God to behave this way. Sometimes we have unexpected and unfair expectations of a church. We expected the church to behave this way. And when the church doesn't behave exactly like God should, oh, that God hates us, the church is no good, I don't ever want anything to do with it. God is evil because he didn't, what, what? He didn't keep us safe. Why? Because God never promised that. We just assume that because we love Jesus, we went to church, he would keep us safe, that we'd never be diagnosed with anything that no harm would befall us. 
And for some of us, we need to go back and do these three steps with God. God, I'm sorry. I had expectations of you that you, you never said you would agree to. And then there are good expectations of God, and this is where we should close, is that, God, I do expect you to always be, as Chris Tomlin's singing on the radio all the time right now, to be a good, good father, to love me even when I don't deserve it, to care for me all the time, to lead me on, to always be there for me, to do the things I didn't even know I need, that a good, good daddy does. Will you pray with me? Holy Lord Jesus, help us to repent. Help us to clarify within ourselves our expectations. And help us to communicate them clearly to others. To your grace and glory, we surrender ourselves. And to this journey of what it means to destroy the myths that destroy our relationships. And into a place where we know you and care for each other in a way that honors you. In Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. You stand and receive your blessing. In Jesus' name, may you go forth as more than conquerors, able to meet the expectations in every relationship you have, able to care for them, able to communicate them, and able to explain why you're not able to meet them. By the grace of God, may you love each other in a more healthy way. In Jesus' name.